Okay, it's the 1st of June 2006 and we're in Tarragona with Belinda Maia from the University of Porto in Portugal. Welcome to Tarragona, Belinda. Okay. Um, you, you spent a long time doing research on the general relation on technical translation and its relation with technology and particularly terminology. Um, what are the main fields that you've been working in and how have you been doing the work? Well, perhaps it comes from the fact that uh, I've been teaching translation for, for years mm -hmm. and that uh, I found that my uh, ex-students were coming back to me and saying the sort of thing we were teaching which was a mixture of literary, newspapers, etc., was simply not helping them with their professional lives. And I think that was combined with the fact that uh, I became interested from a more philosophical point of view in machine translation, and I was co-opted onto the LETRAC project, Language Engineering for Translation Curricula. Mm -hmm. And I think that at that point, I was very much Alice in Wonderland in the middle of the technocrats of language engineering in Saarbrück and etc. But I learned that in fact that the student professionals were learning, earning far more if they could use computers and if they could do things like localization. And I found that uh, this suddenly made me realize that students actually earned their livings doing quite different things than we did at the university. So I tried to encourage this vision and um, one thing led to another, and I began this master's degree in 2000 on mm -hmm. terminology and translation mm -hmm. and found that I had a lot of people wanting to do it and we're now into the fifth okay. master's. And at one stage I found that I was being asked by the students, oh, I want to do automatic term extraction. I want to use technology more in a more sophisticated way than even travels or anything else. So I sent out an SOS and I was then asked to join the Lingua Teca project, which is computational linguistics, basically, run by my colleague Diana from Oslo, Diana Santos. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly found I had a very good young engineer working with me. Okay. Brilliant, in fact. And uh, between us, we devised ways of looking for terms, of creating corpora, because I came from very much from corpus linguistics background. And so we devised this software which you feed in the corpus mm -hmm. and you extract the terminology and you have a database and it's all interconnected. And uh, basically this talk, this was something I'd already been practicing with getting students to look for text on the internet. As soon as I realized out there there were lots of text on any subject and I found I was doing the same as other people. We were sending the students to look for texts to act, not just with terminology, but also getting them used to the idea of uh, looking at text for the type of text. In other words, what was a useful text? Uh, even sort of getting around to, they, with very exercise looking for the text, made them think, well, is this a good example? So that there were two sides of it. There was looking at texts that were typical of a particular domain or typical mm -hmm. genre. On the other hand, there was the idea of extracting terminology, which was suitable. And so we've concentrated very much not on parallel text, but on comparable text. The idea being that the terminology will be better if it's been done by an expert. In so these are non-translations? Non-translations. Non -translation. so comparable. Yeah. Compar the idea is that, in particular, the technical text, uh, translators very often translate the terminology very badly. And this happens again and again. Now, engineers come to me and say, we don't want a translator. We have an engineer who will speak English or whatever. I have one on my course at the moment. He's uh, doing his doctorate in mechanical engineering and doing his course with me because he said I just, he does so much translation but that uh, he needed the, te the theoretical thing from the point of view of translation rather than from the point of view of the engineering. So he came to me and he's doing our course um, and I think this is what happens. So if you have text written by an expert on a particular area in their own language, the terminology is going to be better. 
these tile may not be, but then that's, that's another problem. <laughs> but the, 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 I found that this, is, this has been very useful because it's taught the students not just to look for good terminology and reliable sources, because they soon find that they get used to, with the sheer practice of looking for the text. They get used to finding the good examples instead of bad ones. And this, uh, this particular uh, combination, it, it does concordance and it does everything, and it's done online. They do their own projects online. It doesn't matter where they are. So that's where, that's where I got into this. We, as far as localization is concerned, uh, we don't actually have the wherewithal. We don't have enough people to teach it anyhow. But um, it, I think, needs to be done. And I think, as we were talking earlier, I think that people... There's a small market in Portugal for a start. And I, I had a student last year or year before who, who teaches localization. He reckons that he can teach privately enough people for the Portuguese market, mm -hmm. and does. Okay. Uh, I'm interested in how you got into this part of the world, part of translation studies perhaps, but perhaps it's, it's terminology and, and technology. Uh, going back perhaps in your mid-twenties, where were you, what were you doing? And, how did you get into translation studies from there? Uh, well, I was I so many people who live abroad. I married a Portuguese, and uh, I didn't actually seriously start studying until my thirties. I mean, I was teaching. Do your English. Yes. Like yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, now I started teaching at the university when I was nearly thirty, I suppose, and. After I had children, I decided to do a master's, and then from a master's, I did a doctorate. And one thing leads to another, doesn't it? Why translation studies? <laughs> Partly because that is what, as a person living abroad, you get asked to do, is teach English and teach translation. Mm. And partly because I became really interested. I'm more of a ling into linguistics than yeah. the other side of it, anyhow. But um, I am fascinated oh. by linguistics, and uh, so consequently, Obviously, my, my point of view is from the point of view of linguistics, although uh, I appreciate the other theories and points of view. <laughs> Do you think translation studies as a research discipline should be paying more attention to terminology first and then to technologies in general? I think that translation studies from the point of view of training professionals certainly does, yes. I think it should. Um, the academics may not enjoy it, but uh, I think that from the point of view of the professional translator has to live off it. Mm -hmm. You must teach them how to use the technology, how to use the terminology, and how to find good terminology and build it up. And I think that if we do this too, I, my experience is that uh, I've been working with engineers for, since 2000, now, and now I'm finding that my students are doing traineeships in the Faculty of Engineering and then they get jobs afterwards because the engineers say, oh, finally, we've got somebody who writes both Portuguese and English decently, but they know the terminology, so we can, we can count on them. So that they're gaining, the students are gaining experience, and they're also getting the respect that they didn't have before. That sounds exceptional in Europe. You have that sort of cooperation between faculties. Well, yes, I th at the moment uh, we're reaching a stage where I think we're hoping to do, well, I need to apply for a, shall we say, a university level uh, project so that anyone in the university can use our software and use mm -hmm. our trainees. And I've got a fair amount of support from two or three departments of the Faculty of Engineering. Okay. We've always had a lot from mechanical engineering, now it's uh, telecommunications and electronics, and the uh, I find that uh, by insisting that my masters work with a, with a professor, yeah. or at least somebody with a PhD to do that, and they have their terminology um, cleared by these people, uh, and they, they, they sit in on, their, their, on the juries of their dissertations and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, I've, I've got a doctor sitting on one next, next yeah. week, week after and a geographer who works with me, and we've got, uh, this year we've got two or three students working with the history of art, from, and okay. one, uh, p partly because they have jobs which are related to tourism, and so the history, depart history of art department is very interested in working with us too, so 
It's not just the engineer. Yeah. <laughs> but they're all yeah. all the students work with not with a, with a, with an expert. Your, your language combination is just English Portuguese. No, they can do other languages. That's what the engineers don't really want to know much about anything else. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of them speak very good English anyhow. My prob main problem is finding, getting them to give me texts in Portuguese, because they all write in English. Right, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's. But then I say to them, yeah, but yet you, you're the professors. Sure. Think of all the technicians who would poss and your first and second year students who could possibly learn quicker. I had a medical, I had a, um, one of the professors in medical faculty once said, that you know, the, the learning deficit of the doctors, doc the students coming to be doctors, is considerable due to the lack of language. They're the brightest kids coming out of the school, but they, they're slow in learning because they've got to like learn every language. Yeah, lack of yeah. English. Okay. So they've got to. What do you think? What do you think are the main challenges facing translation studies, at least in the European context? That's a big question. <laughs> um, it's an enormous field, and it's like so many things. I think there are so many different parts to it. And I think, again, translation uh, is just another part of the whole fact that texts generally are no longer what they were. They're no longer this linear thing on a piece of paper. And... Uh, I have a colleague in psycholinguistics who's actually studying the effect of hypertext on the learning of students in schools now. Mm. And uh, the whole idea that you don't read the thing from cover to cover, that you jump around and things. So I think there's a lot of, in a way, the translation is accompanying this. And uh, I think one of the problems probably is translating hypertext and that sort of thing is precisely the knowing how to cope with the other with people who possibly are not used to this or knowing how they might jump from one subject to another. Okay. You know, I think uh, the book that I, I recommend, um, the book on by Minika Hagen and yes. Ashworth, they draw attention to how the Japanese have a different attitude to, um, to chat and things like that, mm. which we don't think about. So I think translation studies is an enormous field. I think that Personally, I like to think of my students having jobs, but uh, <laughs> perhaps I'm un <laughs> not everybody does think like that. And I, th I think we should. I think, uh, I think Bologna is making us think that way, too. Uh, that I think the other day we had a, um, an ex-rector drew attention to the fact of the ideal, the Humbertian ideal of a university, which is, shall we say, above politics, above economics, and how... This was an 18th century ideal, which was all very well at a time, at the time that, uh, and we shouldn't go too far to respecting the market, but at the same time in our day and age when we have this mass university education instead of an elite, it's uh, possibly have to be more pragmatic. Good. Thank you very much, Melinda.